Uh, now, though, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Sunny Nakai. Uh, she's an assistant dean for admissions, uh, recruitment, and student life at the Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine. Uh, she is an assistant professor of medical education, where she studies access and inequality in medical education. Uh, prior to uh, joining the uh, Strict family, uh, Dr. Nakai served as the uh, director of the Office of Diversity at the Feinberg School of uh, Medicine at Northwestern University, where she worked with uh, campus and community constituencies to uh, address issues of underrepresentation in medicine, culture, humility, education, and partnership, and uh, health inequities. Dr. Nikkei uh, uh, attended, uh, completed her, her, her undergraduate and uh, master's at the University of Utah, and she did her, uh, her PhD in higher education at uh, Loyola University in uh, Chicago. She was born and raised in uh, the Portland, Oregon area, and she is the second uh, youngest of five siblings, uh, first-generation college graduate, and the only individual in her family, an extended family, to uh, earn an advanced college degree. Uh, she uh, is very busy with a new job at uh, Loyola, who we're uh, having breakfast uh, earlier. But she's also a uh, she has a full-time job and totally enjoys uh, being a mom to twin six-year-old girls. So I'm very, very um, um, I'm honored and um, I'm very excited to uh, to hear Sunny uh, talk to us um, this morning about uh, stereotype threats in the um, in uh, medical e education. Sunny. Thank you. Good morning, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, as Margaret said, I normally try to catch up with a couple of six-year-olds and uh, I'm always fascinated by their curiosities. Yesterday I got asked how birds sit on power lines without getting electrocuted. Does anybody know this? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Google. I don't, what did our parents do before Google? It turns out that if they touch both of their wings down at the same time and actually complete the circuit, they do get electrocuted. So they, uh, through a process of learning, they have to not do that. Um, and I just discovered that the, there are several bald eagles in Decora that have a cam, and a couple of the eaglets last year actually died that way. So I, I had no idea of that. I also was asked in the winter time when people die, and the ground is frozen, how do they bury them? They, they do, they have special diggers that dig through frozen ground. So these are the wonderful things that six-year-olds are, are curious about these days. Um, we won't talk about that, we'll talk about stereotype threat in the medical education uh, continuum. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to discuss this, I'm very passionate about it as I've spent my time in medical education and explored this issue of which students do well, which students don't, how we struggle to really advance um, our careers and the careers of those that are sort of missing persons in medical education, I think this is uh, an important issue to, to address. So for whom is campus designed? Uh, to begin with this question to think about which students do we think likely have the lowest or highest needs for the services that we offer? Which students are likely to feel automatically welcome when they step foot on campus? Who is really likely to feel like, wow, this space was really made for me? Um, which students fit our curriculum? Which students are really gonna kind of resonate with the cases that are there? Those, those are the things that are gonna be um, ripe in their experiences. Which students fit our learning modalities well? I know later you're gonna talk about kind of changing the way that the classroom is done and, and more active learning. Um, which students are much more accustomed to a hands-on learning style versus a, more of a, a lecture format? Which students see aspects of their identities modeled and reflected in the campus consistently? In the faculty, in the textbooks, in the photos, whose skin is represented, whose hair is represented, which types of things show up as, um, as facts in our books and who do those reaffirm on a daily basis? Which students really feel at home? Uh, when you think about this concept of feeling at home, you feel comfortable, you can be yourself, you can uh, try something hard and not worry that somebody might judge you and think that that's, um, that that's going to be a reflection of your full potential, right? So spaces on our campus that um, emphasize who has been here before and who this is built for can serve as, as a stereotype threat. So I'm at Loyola, we're a Jesuit institution. Um, this is actually a picture from one of the chapels at Northwestern. Um, but I never thought about this. My students are the ones that raised my awareness about this issue, about Judeo-Christian privilege, 
Our academic calendar itself communicates to students of other faiths that this, this calendar doesn't revolve around your holidays. It revolves around other holidays, mainly Christian ones, right? So campus spaces where um, we're emphasizing our faith-based roots, those are okay, but extra messaging is required around who, um, who is of a different faith. Uh, we pride ourselves in being a home for all faiths and try to have as many uh, interfaith spaces as we can. This is from uh, the conference room. This, these look familiar. I don't know who these are. It doesn't matter. Um, but in, in medical education, this is who wrote the book. This is who has the awards. These are the pioneers. These, this is the emphasis on the roots of it. And I never really thought about um, how much that mattered until one of my students from University of Utah, there's a corridor that connects the hospital to the School of Medicine and all along that corridor were kind of pioneers and donors and he said, yeah, I just love walking past the glowering eyes of, of the great wall of, of philanthropy that just, I feel very stared down every time I walk through that corridor from the school to the hospital. Um, and I never really thought about it. Um, there's a, a provost conference room at Northwestern. These are the pictures on the walls. One uh, woman, which is great, I, she's not wearing a suit. That's too much to ask. But um, it, again, not really even thinking about how just the decorations and pictures on the wall, who, who we are talking about um, has been honored in the past at our institution, um, communicates belonging and communicates messaging. Um, there's a stretch metal gallery. I need to update this so I can take a picture of that because it is where we have a lot of our meetings and all around the walls are all the recipients of stretch medals and they look a lot like all of these uh, photos. So again, it's sort of emphasizing um, who belongs and who's honored. The context that we're in impacts how we learn. So our campus spaces, like I said, colors, architecture, awards, um, the honorees, the names of the buildings, the layout of the spaces, um, our classroom spaces and how those are organized. Are they flexible? Are they fixed? There's usually a front row and a back row. We typically have a, um, a focal point at the front, and, and it's very hierarchical in nature. Rather than having a seating like this where there are much more you know, uh, tables uh, where people can sit in communities a little differently than emphasizing just an individual learning um, modality. Um, the faces on campus are peers, faculty, staff, students. Um, and I put maintenance and grounds workers because a lot of our institutions look a lot like the Titanic, right? Where we have sort of in the upper echelons people with a lot more privilege who have much bigger paychecks. And as we go below deck, we get a lot more diversity. And what does that feel like for students who might only see themselves represented in that deck of the Titanic on campus, not the upper deck, right? How is that communicated every day when you think, gosh, you know, the people that I can speak Spanish to or that I want to talk to and get to know um, are folks who are sweeping the halls. And I think we can do a lot to leverage the, that that is a strength for our campuses. That's part of our diversity. But our structures often don't allow us to do that. We're often very segregated in how we do things. Um, so one thing that every one of us can do interpersonally differently is to get to know a name and a face personally of someone who's not on our deck, right? Who's the person that you see in the bathroom when you're using the bathroom that's cleaning? Introduce yourself, say your name, get to know that person. Um, and it does impact the team space environment in the hospital as well, that the people who are cleaning the rooms or that are bringing the trays are not nameless folks. They're part of the healthcare team. Their role is important. So we have more diversity than we think sometimes if we will create structures to be able to, to capitalize on that. Um, our materials, our books, our resources, our food, um, even just saying like what types of foods are served in our cafeteria, um, what do the resources that students are given look like. Uh, one of the students was talking about a Durham textbook where all the slides are um, pigmented the same, very light skin pigmented, like lots of our textbooks are normed in a certain way with a certain bias. Uh, we were joking about Durham in one of our meetings and saying at Northwestern we had a clinic, one of our faculty focused on um, research that uh, with skin of color and they had a clinic for a long time called the ethnic skin clinic because they just didn't know what to call it because the, the default term of skin clinic was that it wasn't focusing on skin with pigment at all. So this entire profession built and kind of normed on who's classically gone into Durham and what do those textbooks look like. So what does psoriasis look like in, in deeply pigmented skin or skin that has brown pigment, right? 
that's not going to be taught in the textbooks. So shocking that Durham lacks diversity as a profession, because even as you're learning about this profession, you're not seeing yourself uh, represented. Um, so if the campus were an article of clothing, for which students would it fit perfectly? And for whom might it require tailoring? And I think becoming um, an effective teacher is kind of understanding where do we need to make those nips and tucks, and who can we consider in our classroom um, to offer the learning so that it has a broader reach and it can be offered without this threat of um, identity really impacting it. So the story of stereotype threat, and um, there's a wonderful book by Claude Steele. It's sort of the anthology of stereotype threat. Uh, it's written in a story format. It's very interesting. It's called Whistling Vivaldi. And uh, the title comes from a story that he opens with about a graduate student who uh, was studying at the University of Chicago who was met with so much kind of resistance and kind of microaggressions as he walked around campus in Hyde Park. People would cross the street. People would ask him for his ID frequently. He was treated as a threat most places that he went, being a black man in higher education. And he discovered that as he was walking around and going to markets in Hyde Park, that if he whistled Vivaldi, that communicated to people that he was of culture, that he was different, that, that he was familiar with their world in a way um, that decreased the threat. And so he started to do this and noticed how human behavior around him just universally changed. Um, and so the story of stereotype threat begins with exploring the achievement gap and looking at how students of color generally scored lower on standardized exams and why was this the case. Um, and possible reasons that they brainstormed. Well, there could be this lower innate intelligence. Everybody knows about you know, this earlier publications around bell curves and things like this. Um, the effects of poverty, uh, lower skills and preparation resources, creating these deficits in performance. Uh, cultural discouragement is a big theory around, well, some people, some cultures encourage education and some discourage it. So students of color are taught that if they're achieving, that that's acting white. So what are the reasons for this achievement gap? So as researchers moved things forward, we discovered that there's still a middle class achievement gap. So what's that about? When we close um, the, the resources and, and we, we take or control for the effects of poverty or even eliminate the effects of poverty, there is still a gap going on. And, and what is that about? Even at the highest levels of income with lots of resources, there still exists this gap between students of color and whites. So it's not simply a question of resources. So what's going on? So Claude Steele and um, his research assistant, Josh Aronson, decided that they would really look at intelligence and explore if it could be impacted by social context. Um, and this is one of um, Josh's favorite quotes around human intelligence, that it is actually quite fragile. Uh, it doesn't take a lot to distract it, to suppress it, or even annihilate it. Um, and if you've ever been a parent, you, you get this because you can have a PhD and several peer-reviewed publications and not know how to get a six-month-old kid to sleep. And all of a sudden just feel like, oh, I am so inept at doing this simple thing, right? It depends on the context and how much we feel like we can do things or not do things. Um, there's the studies around fifth grade students who were told they were gifted. That it, it just messaging to the students, oh, you're the gifted group, all of a sudden changes how they perceive expectations about them. Um, think about time pressure, right? How long does it take you to do crossword puzzle or Sudoku? But what if there was a time limit? Or what if there was a penalty for mistakes? Or what if, as you did it, it was on the screen so everybody else could see your moves and the mistakes that you were making as you were doing it? Uh, would your confidence level change? Would you be more careful? Would you work more slowly? Would you begin to doubt yourself? Would you exit the task completely, as I probably would say? I'm not putting, you know, I'm putting this up here. Um, I play words with friends, you know, on my phone. Thank God people can't see all the words you try before you actually get a word, right? I was one of the things I was, can you see what I'm doing while I'm guessing? Is, is quag a word? I'm not sure. But when someone's watching, it changes how we think about our abilities and what we're projecting about our intelligence to other people, and that, that makes a difference. Um, they change under pressure, walking on a balance beam, walking on the curb. If I just took something the same distance apart as a curb and put it 10 feet in the air or between two buildings uh, in downtown Chicago, that would change the task. It's actually the same in terms of putting one foot in front of the other on this beam, but putting it up in the air, changing the difficulty level, um, creating pressure changes how we perform. So there are social factors that affect our performance. Um, interpersonal intimidation can certainly do that, and our belongingness. Um, so this notion of 
how we are social creatures. Um, one of the studies that they did looking at belongingness, threat, and IQ was to give the students an IQ test and then to separate them into three groups. And one group was told, you're, you're socially normal, we've screened you, you're going to be fine. The second group was told that they were accident prone. This was the control group that was supposed to be a negative condition just to see if it would affect their um, intelligence. You're probably going to break a lot of bones, you know, you, you're going to miss a lot of work because you're just, you're very accident prone. Something in this um, battery that we gave you demonstrated that you're accident prone. And the third group was told that they were likely to be lonely throughout their lives. Well, even if you have friends now, there's something about your, you know, this test that we've done, you're probably going to be alone, you're probably never going to find a partner. Um, and then they retested these three groups. And the alone group post-tested six points lower. Right? And then they debriefed them and said, you know, all of this stuff was really fictitious. We were just trying to see if this was about intelligence. But it's interesting to me that people who are told that they are going to be isolated, that they're not going to find anywhere to fit, um, suddenly it affects their, their performance on an academic um, indicator. So what is stereotype threat? Apprehension arising from awareness of negative stereotypes, um, personal reputation in a situation where the stereotype becomes relevant and thus potentially confirmable. So I think that people think that women are not good at science. And I'm in a setting where my uh, chops as a scientist are on the line. And I become very aware that I can confirm this negative stereotype around women in science, or I can disprove it. And I start to take on that weight of confirming it. Uh, it's a situational experience um, where you feel vulnerable by the, pressure, the possibility that you could confirm this negative stereotype. Um, it affects highly skilled individuals. Uh, the more you uh, care about what it is you're doing, the more you're invested in being seen as a scientist, the more uh, the effects are, are strengthened. Um, you don't have to believe that the stereotype is true to be effective. In fact, most people don't believe the neg negative stereotypes about which they are aware of their group, um, but you don't have to believe that it's true for it to impact you. Um, so. Sorry, that's a repeat slide. So some comments, some meta stereotypes that are out there um, about other people's stereotypes. All realtors think Jews are stingy. All whites think blacks are criminals. Um, black people think white people are racist. Latinos think blacks are rude. I mean, so any of these that, that we arise from our social context that are um, common. You know, old people have dementia. Men don't follow directions. You know, women can't drive. I mean, any of these things that, that we know about in our social context um, can create it. You know, this is my favorite one, White Men Can't Jump. It was actually a fun study at, that they did with the Stanford track team where um, they wanted to know if the stereotype existed for physical tasks as well as academic ones. So they brought in an all-black training team for the mostly white Stanford track athletes and, and told them to make kind of little comments about, oh, their calves are really small and this and that. Oh, you know, they can't jump. And, and some of their jumpers, you know, in, in high jump, long jump, they decreased their performance. They went, uh, in high jump, I think it was three inches or something like that, um, just to create the stereotype that the people who are watching you think that you cannot do this very well. And none of the athletes believed that about themselves. They knew they were elite college athletes, but it turns out it does work. Um, another one of the studies was done on, on mini golf. And they brought in a group of, of black athletes and a group of white athletes and said, um, this is a we're going to study as you play your, your sports intelligence. So they created a stereotype threat for the black athletes. And turns out an average of five strokes higher on that golf game. Well, then they reversed it and said, we're going to study your natural, your raw sports ability, your natural sports ability. So they created a stereotype threat for the white athletes, and it absolutely flip-flopped. White, the white athletes had higher uh, strokes there. So again, not that much changes. Not even This wasn't even a very difficult task, but we are very much affected by what we believe others think about our abilities. So we all have these meta stereotypes. They're sort of in the air. They're in the social context in which we um, live and work. So the cultural stereotypes that exist can create a threat when our performance is on the line. And it can, it can lead to these performance deficits and disidentity um, with domain. And this is the biggest reason why I think we struggle with um, persisting in careers in STEM and law, several different professions where there are missing persons as you go higher up the rank because a, a defense mechanism is, well, I didn't really want to do that anyway. If I'm, if I'm going to persist into doing this and I have to constantly feel like I'm having to prove something additional about myself, then I will go away from that um, so that my performance isn't impacted. So when ability is important, it can, it can disrupt what it is we're doing. 
um, proving yourself, you're failing your whole race. Um, and the more you care about your performance, the greater potential to be affected. I've seen this with students who are pre-meds who are studying for the MCAT. They really, really want to get into medical school. They're trying so hard and they're studying and their practice tests are coming out well and they go and take the exam and their scores several points lower than what they really thought it was going to be. Um, so sometimes it can help explain um, why, there's, why there's a performance um, deficit. So the mechanisms are anxiety, decreased working memory, um, a lack of focus and concentration, and I'd like to think of it as running several scripts in the background while you're trying to perform in the foreground, right? So when, when you do that control alt delete on your computer and you're like, oh, I gotta shut all these other things off because it's making my computer run really slowly. Um, a student who is coming into a clerkship situation who's underrepresented is gonna be thinking about um, is this person, how is this person judging me? Am I coming across too strong? Am I coming, you know, how am I managing my, my presence socially when other students might be just really trying to focus on getting that H&P done and working on their presentation, other students are thinking about how they're coming across socially. They're running several scripts in the background that can definitely affect um, their performance. So conditions that are necessary for this. The stereotype exists and it's widely known, it's common. Um, you identify with the domain. You're trying to be a medical student, a doctor, a researcher. Um, it's usually high achieving and high performing individuals because investment in doing the goal is, is necessary. Uh, the task at hand is hard or represents a challenge. So for things that are easy, it's not likely to, to be induced because if our performance doesn't matter that much or the, it's not a difficult task where some people are going to make it and some people aren't, um, it tends to not uh, create stereotype threat. And again, individuals don't have to believe this stereotype is true uh, in order to be affected. So the impacts of this definitely undermines interest in careers. When we constantly are in, in social contexts where we're not affirmed, we don't feel like we belong, we feel that we have to prove ourselves in addition to just doing the task. But how am I as a researcher is not where it stops. How am I as a researcher as a woman? How am I a researcher as a woman in my mid-career? When all these other things start coming into play, um, people tend to lose interest or disidentify. Um, creates performance decrements, as we talked about with exams. Um, most of the, the studies um, that are looking at performance on exams, memory tasks, the, the difference can be as much as 6 to 7%, some of them as much as 10%, and that's, that, that's drastic. That could be an A or a B in a class. That's a 3.3 versus the 3.7 on your GPA over time. Um, so again, students are thinking, I tried all these things, I'm falling short, maybe I am confirming these stereotypes, maybe it's true, and people can really begin to internalize um, performance deficits. It undermines women's and minorities' um, leadership aspirations to go to the table and not see yourself reflected or feel as though um, your leadership style isn't going to be valued because it's different than somebody else or you're going to have to prove yourself um, beyond your peers. And increases when your investment in the domain increases. So the effects really strengthen um, the more you want the goal. So what are some interventions? Um, and this is the important part of things that we can all do in, in our teaching context and in our classrooms to try to lessen this for learners and for our colleagues. Um, breaking identity threat links, which is diversity. So it's easy to sort of see someone as, as singular, like, oh, this person's the only woman at the table, so therefore they will represent the woman's perspective and everything loaded onto this person. But if we have a lot more diversity at the table, that gets diffused among the group. The group takes responsibility for thinking about how this might impact this population or that population. Fostering belongingness and inclusion on campus. Looking at our campus spaces, looking at how we run programs and saying, for whom, for whom does this work and who does it not work and how can we make some of those changes? Um, a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Often threat is really increased when it's you get one shot at it and if you didn't make the cut, then you're labeled as the you're not going to make the cut kind of group. Instead of thinking of it as um, in coaching and mentoring, people having the resources to get there. Here's a high standard. I'm confident that you can do this. Here are the resources to get there. And focusing on growth. Um, it's not you arrive either with this actual potential to do this or not, um, but it's a function of people's effort and the resources employed. Utilizing role models, I think, is important. And we can do this virtually, and we can do this um, on campus, I think it's difficult. Uh, all medical schools struggle with diversifying their faculty. I think nationwide, it's probably around 6% underrepresented and one in four full professors are women. So there's no school that's immune um, from, from the faculty diversity issue. And I think utilizing role models 
putting up slides, looking at people in the field. Here are five people who are dermatopathologists. This is what they look like. I mean, we have a lot of opportunities to kind of show um, diversity within a field, even if it's not on our campus, just to make our students and learners aware of the diversity that's out there. And setting expectations for, for students and being very transparent about those expectations. Um, who gets, gets what resources and why? Uh, a lot of assumptions can be made about who gets what and why that increase stereotype threat. Oh, that person got that because of such and such. So um, if we can make sure that we're transparent about our decisions and resources, that's, that's important. Um, when I first took over diversity at Northwestern, it was called the Office of Minority and Cultural Affairs. And I had a lot of students come in who were majority students, white students or Asian students even. And they would say, am I allowed to walk in here? Am I allowed to be in this office? And I'd, excuse me? Well, I'm not a minority and I have no culture. Um, I said, oh my God, sit down. You are the one that needs to be in this office. You know? So we would talk about it, but I realized that I needed to start being really transparent and really open about what is the mission of this office and who is it for and what are my expectations for students to engage in diversity, that it's everyone's business. The only requirement for walking in is that you care and that you're willing to learn, that you're willing to have open discussions and kind of move yourself forward along that spectrum of, of cultural awareness and, um, and humility. So making sure that we uh, message you know, who is it for and what are our expectations. Um, and high standards plus resources. A couple of mentoring studies that were very interesting that looked at race concordant and race discordant um, mentoring showed that race alone was not enough for effective mentoring, that the most um, effective mentoring options and mentees that made the most gains were those that were shown, here's the standard for a peer-reviewed published article and then were given the resources to get there. And even if they didn't actually reach their goal, they were very happy with the tutelage that they were getting because they knew that the feedback that they were getting, they could trust it. And they felt like there was more investment in their career being told, this is the standard, and when you get there, you will know that you get there, and here are the things that I'm gonna do to provide resources so you can work to get to this point. Um, that was more important to mentees um, than, than, agree, than race concordance and, and some of the other factors that they looked at. So I definitely think um, being able to, to feel that this person is invested in your success comes with that transparency, that honesty, and also that support. Um, so belongingness. Take a second, think about a time when you felt like you didn't belong. You showed up at the Ohio State game in Michigan gear. You <laughs> walked into a bourbon tasting convention knowing nothing about bourbon. You went to a little village to go shopping at some of the markets in Chicago and had no idea what some of the norms were for those markets. Um, I sent one of my friends, do you guys have Aldi here maybe? No? It's like this you know, European market style thing where you have to use a quarter to get a cart. They don't have, and you have to bring your own bags and stuff. It's like this whole, they have it in Chicago. But I sent a friend there and he, you didn't tell me this weird cart thing and that you didn't have to have a bag and I looked like such an idiot when I was shopping there. And you can only use your debit card, you're not allowed to use credit. Um, they, they have discount groceries, it's like run by Trader Joe's. Um, but he had this experience where he felt like such an outsider, he didn't belong, he didn't have the skills to be there, people were looking at him, he felt really stupid. Um, and when we feel like we don't belong, our behavior changes. Where we normally might be extroverted, we might jump right in, we might offer an answer, all of a sudden we, we kind of fold in. Um, how we engage changes if we feel like we don't belong, and that, that is so, so true in classrooms, in small groups, in clerkship groups when we're rounding with patients, um, feeling like you're not part of this team um, impacts the levels of engagement. Um, so our behavior changes when we feel like we don't belong. So as educators, I am gonna kind of go through these four things that discuss what it is that we can do. Um, to be aware and attentive, open and acknowledging of stereotype threat in our um, teaching in campus settings. So with regards to awareness, it starts with the self, um, that kind of inventory of me, what my own upbringing, what are my assumptions that I bring to the classroom, what's my worldview, my default worldview, the lens that I look through, um, the assumptions that I make without having to actually make an effort to have those assumptions. Um, and consider that and think about how that might be impacting your teaching, the cases that you choose, the types of discussions that you're bringing up. Um, we teach who we are. So one of my favorite educators, Parker Palmer, talks about this a lot, that we bring our identities with us in the classroom and we might try to just teach the material, but who we are comes through in our teaching, it comes through in our style and how we manage the classroom, which students we notice and which students we don't. So being very aware of our own um, upbringing when it comes to our culture 
uh, definitely impacts it. An example, I grew up in a two-parent home in the suburbs, and I didn't grow up taking public transportation at all. And when I was doing my social work degree, um, one of our teachers for the day said, we're not having class today. You guys are going to ride the bus. And he gave us an assignment. You have to go to the uh, SNAP office, and you have to get a SNAP application. You have to go to Social Security. You have to go to unemployment. You have to do this. And all of you are going to ride the bus. And when we get back to next class, you can tell us if you got the items that I told you to get and what that was like. What an education for me, who my default worldview without even thinking about it was that I get in my car and I go somewhere. And, I, and the, the challenge is finding where to park. Right? I, I didn't have this, this skill set of an appreciation for what it was like to use um, public transportation. So when I started thinking about how I was treating my clients, if they were late, maybe I need to be asking them how they're coming to clinic. Maybe I need to be working on relating towards them instead of just having my latent view being well, you leave 15 minutes. You get in your car, you leave enough time. Like, what's the big deal? Well, you miss this transfer, you miss that transfer. This bus doesn't come at all. Um, it's really crowded on the bus. It's very stressful. So any of our clients that were bringing children along, that were dealing with strollers and car seats and things like this on, on public transit, a whole new level of appreciation that increased um, that awareness around what it is people are going through to make it to my door for an appointment. So instead of, um, God, that person is always late, it's thank you for being here, right? It completely changes how uh, we think about something. So what are your kind of given assumptions for how you were raised, um, your worldview, and your norms? And how does this affect your teaching style? How does this affect the way that you prefer to, to present um, information? So broadening your awareness of your learners. Um, I love doing a pre-class profile. It's one of my what's one of my favorite techniques. I have I ask all the students that are enrolled in my class to I fill, to fill out a profile in advance. It includes maybe their motivation for either taking the class if it's, if it's higher ed or in medicine. You know why did you choose to become a doctor? Kind of circling back. Um, what's going on in your life right now? That's your biggest challenge. What are you the most happy about? Sometimes I'll ask a fun question about what's your favorite um, indulgent food? What's your favorite healthy food? And I'll I'll try to bring throughout the class maybe one of those things um, and highlight it. Get to know a little bit about them before the, the class starts so that when we have name tags and everything in the classroom, I will be able to have a little bit of a background on the students. I use placards and name tags regularly. Um, this helps me avoid embarrassment and calling students the wrong name because there are students who don't think that's a big deal and there are students who have that happen to them all the time that you know you mix up two students who are both African American or both Asian and you accidentally call them by the wrong name and in my case I'm just really bad with names but to those students they don't know that that's just me you know and one of my silly things of just being bad with that so I ask bring a bunch of markers and stamps and Here's a piece of paper and fold it in half and make yourself a placard and bring it to class when you, when you come to class. That way classmates can address each other by name. People can really get to know each other. It be, makes who we are important in the learning concept uh, in the learning context, which it really is. Um, so I, I do the pre-class profile. I do name placards um, because it helps me manage the classroom better and feel more confident that when students are participating, I have a little bit of background about where it is they're coming from. I also share my profile. I do one. I send it to the students. I try to have that reciprocity with students that I'm willing to be as open and as vulnerable in the learning environment as I'm asking them to be. Um, creating communities of practice is another good option. Rather than always having a single focal point of learning and everybody learning from this one person, and it kind of ends up being this, um, I call it the empty bucket education model, right? I'm the expert. Everyone's empty headed. I pour my expertise into everybody else's brain. It, it doesn't acknowledge the expertise that's in the room. And one of our advantages as faculty is our students are very diverse. And they're almost always more diverse than we are. So what they bring with them into the classroom is one way that we can incorporate more diversity into our pedagogy if we give them an opportunity to share that in the classroom. Um, so if there is a topic, we can assign students groups and, and create some communities of practice where they can share ideas, they can come up with strategies, they can work on a case. Um, sometimes I have them write their own cases and give them to another group so that my biases or whatever is coming is not just, I'm always dictating the, the conversations that are being had. Uh, it ends up being more relevant to them. They write better cases than sometimes I could um, with what's going on in the world around them and the things that they're seeing. Purposeful um, use of language. We, us, them, they, those people. Um, we have this way of creating a veil when we teach that we talk about issues as if they don't impact people in the room. So we might be discussing low-wage workers as if no one in the room 
has any loved ones of that background or, or who has ever been a low wage worker. Oh, you know, the people that clean hotel rooms. And there might be students who are like, yeah, I did that when I was in college, or that's what my mom does for a living. You know, so um, it's the same thing with diseases. We might talk about people with HIV positive status or diabetes or other types of, of diseases as if no one among us is affected by those things. So again, trying to think about our use of, of this, this language around um, the royal we um, can really make some students feel very excluded if they're seeing themselves as outside of this norm um, versus inside this norm. So being mindful of who's in the room, who our learners are, and, and kind of what's going on in their life. So attentiveness. Um, taking time to explain the foundations of knowledge and their sources, the who of who teaches is important. So as we're using material from someone else to be able to say um, not just the author's name, this person's last name's Kennedy, but who are they? Where did they go to school? What is their background? So I'd like to show a picture of the people who um, have pioneered certain theories or have written certain books so it gives a little bit more of a name and a face to the, the material that I'm teaching. Um, and the who of who teaches is important. I'm talking about why I chose them. I might choose specific people who I disagree with or who have uh, a different viewpoint about either a learning theory or something to do with bias. I use a couple of, of researchers that uh, are teachers that have a different way of talking about privilege than I figure um, to kind of introduce a spectrum of, of issues. Um, when you're in the classroom, examine who's engaged in learning and who's not. And if you notice a student who you don't think is engaged, who, who it, their, their group doesn't seem to be going well, they seem to be standoffish, our latent assumption is the student doesn't care, right? I'm busting my butt as a teacher, I'm putting together all these things, they're not engaged, they don't care. Instead of, of, of giving them either no attention at all, I would like to call them in and say, I noticed that, that you don't participate in your group you know, what's going on in your group? Is there something that, that needs to be changed? Because sometimes there are issues that come up with students that um, really inhibit their learning. Somebody made a comment or a student doesn't feel comfortable. And we can't always do those things. But I think making an extra step to say, hey, I, I noticed you and your learning in this class is important as everybody else is learning. Um, and so if there's something that can be changed or can be done, um, try to do that. The process and content in the classroom both receive attention. Um, and so this is, I'm dragging this in from my, from my social work days, any of my psychiatry friends will laugh. But the who is speaking, who is silent, and, and which students are resonating with the material. So how is class happening in addition to what we are actually being taught? Um, are certain students very dominant? Uh, are certain students taking a back seat? Or when we are broaching up issues of challenging someone in a discussion, how, how does that happen? If somebody wants to say, well, wait a minute, if someone has diabetes and they, don't, they live in a food desert, how are they supposed to treat their diabetes? And this question gets shut down, or this question gets minimized, or we just gloss over it. We don't make time to talk about the issues that students raise. So does our process create that space for students and welcome that space for students to bring in their perspectives? And creating a shared identity among learners is important. Um, I always try to choose uh, a theme of some sort, especially if I teach like an evaluation class. I try to do like survivor or something. I put the students in tribes. I ask them to create a shared identity among their group. We might do bandanas and they might do buffs. And it's really cheesy, but it certainly helps them to see themselves as more the same than different, right? And gives them a shared platform that's unique to this learning space where they feel like they fit in their group. And there's a solidarity between their group and another group. We might do some some active learning activities where there's a competition or something that really helps them gel together as a shared identity of learners. Um, particularly in clerkship groups, I think this undercurrent of competition can really undermine belonging for students who feel like they just can't compete. They're not seen as the ideal student for whatever reason they might perceive, um, and it can really impact their clerkship grades, their level of engagement, um, and their sense of belonging. And so making sure if if you're leading a clerkship or you're talking in a small group, that you let each of them know that they're of equal standing and that they will all get better grades if they work together. You have an expectation that they will be collaborative and that they'll help each other. Um, and fostering belongingness, I like to do a mixture of assigned seats and choose your own. Um, and I like to see if at the beginning of the, of the class, if I let people choose their own, where people sit and then doing some assigned groups, and then mid-class letting people choose, and see if the students themselves are mixing voluntarily. Am I doing something right that's letting this, I, these ideas exchange and flow? Um, part of our struggle with diversity in higher ed is that we recruit um, diverse seeds, and then we put them 
together and expect that like something magic is going to happen if we just recruit people who are different from each other. But getting the most from that diversity requires intention. Um, so we can't just say we're going to recruit diverse seeds and not change the soil or plant half of them in the shade and half of them in the sun and say, well, how could, well, there must have just been bad seeds, right? Nothing magical happened to our harvest. What, what, what did we do here? So I think paying attention to that classroom context and that learning context is important. Um, using multiple response methods, um, methods where students can um, respond anonymously. Uh, we have the clickers, there's like cell phone ones you can do now. There's lots of different ways to be able to get feedback on what's happening with learning, um, where students can, can be really fearless and, and challenge themselves without feeling like they're going to lose something. Um, and I see this with my six-year-olds. I call it the try-hard muscle. Because my girls are really smart, but they love that like I'm so smart label. And there's so much research that says that labeling kids as smart does not help them achieve because they're afraid to try things that are hard. And then, oh no, I'm not going to be smart. If I don't do this right the first time, I'm not going to be smart. Um, so praising them on their effort is much more important than praising them on the outcome. Um, and I think for students who feel like they're the ones that are labeled as smart, they may they contribute ultimately less in the classroom if um, there's opportunities for them to, you know, not opportunities for them to fail uh, in a safe way. And then a mid-course assessment of how it's going, getting some feedback from students. Um, you know, what types of things you, do, do you want to see in the classroom? Is it, is it meeting your learning needs, your expectations? And what types of things are you willing to do? Do you have ideas about what you're willing to do for some of these future classes? Um, if I can swing it in my semester schedule, I leave the class open and I make my um, grad students plan it themselves. And usually it's on like diverse pedagogies or something interesting. But I will let them choose a topic that's relevant to the overall course um, and plan it themselves so that there's also this appreciation of what goes into creating those learning experiences. And, um, and when they assign reading and no one does it, then they can also <laughs> have a sense of what that's like. I'm just kidding. But um, you know, I think using some different uh, te techniques in the classroom to try to be attentive to what's happening, how are people learning and relating, um, and, and flipping that role you know, as teacher and learner. Um, the openness. So being both a teacher and a learner, um, part of the, the challenge with getting diversity right is this feeling that we have to be experts on everything. right? And when we don't know what the terminology might be or enough about the issue, we feel less empowered to be an ally or to step up or to say something or to challenge it. Um, I was with some students who were talking about rotation that they were doing in the emergency department. And some of the um, staff members were discussing a trans patient in a very disrespectful way, saying, you know, it and not using pronouns that were respectful. And the student said, I didn't, I didn't really know what to say because I, I wasn't sure like what the preferred pronouns were. And, and I, I felt like I needed to interrupt it because I could tell by the tone of the conversation, they were kind of snickering and laughing that it, that it was rude. But I didn't, I didn't know how to correct them. And I said, it is possible to point out to people that there might be a better way and that we're, we right now are falling below this threshold of respect that we feel that we should have in our profession. And, and then ask the group, you know, what, might, what could we be doing instead? We don't always have to have the answers. And that's positioning yourself as a co-learner with, other, with others who might be falling short, saying like, we're all falling short right now, but surely we know that we can do better than, what, than what's happening right now. So we don't have to be an expert always um, to interrupt it. Or if we get asked a question that we can't answer, we're in the weeds in something cultural or political, it's always good to open it back up to the class and say, what are the ideas that are in the room about this? Surely someone um, has ideas about this. So that, that feeling of, again, the bucket model where we really have to have all the answers um, sometimes is very stifling and can create a lot of threat because it means that we have the authority to say what knowledge is, is blessed and what knowledge isn't instead of really focusing on the communities that are in our classrooms. Modeling different uh, ideas and new perspectives. Um, point out who's missing in the presentation or which things might have flaws. When we talk about studies, you know, well, who were the subjects here? And for which communities might this not work? It doesn't take that much extra time to talk about um, when we're talking about best practices or when we're working through kind of the norm of something to say, what groups might this not work for? Um, I like to talk about the pain scale. Everybody knows the pain scale, the big round thing in the faces. Well, there's a very flawed assumption in this pain scale, and that is that people would actually show their pain on their face. But if my background includes being a lot more stoic about pain or not 
not actually showing on my face how much pain I'm in or I'm able to keep myself more calm despite it being difficult. I mean, my partner is a welder and put a metal rod in his thigh and had a very bad third degree burn. Finished the job, like, when I, I, he sent me a photo. I, you're going to the emergency room right now, this is a third degree burn. But was very calm and I'm sure putting this, you know, pain scale, just the, the last guy's, you know, ah, he has this horrible freak out. I mean, there's an assumption there. So this modality of assessing pain is a very cultural issue. And I think we gloss over that as if, you know, a very important part of our history taking doesn't have some potential for error in the tools that we're using. Because who made the tools, right? There's always a back up and think about who constructed this and for whom does it fit. Um, so making sure that we point those things out when we're teaching and in the classroom creates that space for students who have a different perspective to feel like that's valued and to feel like they belong. Um, asking for, for feedback about the blind spots and omissions. Maybe students identify those things much more readily. Um, I did a whole series on, on different privileges and the students were the ones that brought up to me the, the religious privilege and said, I'm not sure if I'm Muslim how great I feel about arriving at the trauma center at Barnes Jewish. And I said, oh my god, I, I never thought about that. I never thought about how many of our hospitals, you know, Advocate Christ Medical Center and I mean all these different ones that we have in Chicago that are, that are sponsored by faith-based institutions um, and how that might affect a patient's um, level of comfort with their care or their or their doubts about their needs being able to be met. I, I never thought about that before. The students were the ones that pointed that out uh, to me. So asking for, you know, what's missing from this or how might not how might this not work? When we talk about learning theories, most of the learning theories are built on the basic assumption that your needs are met, that, that you're getting enough to eat, that you have food and shelter and safety. And so how is learning impacted when one of those things is, is missing? Um, and, and we talk about that. Um, never teach the same lecture twice. Um, make it a goal as an educator to always change something. What did you learn the last time you lectured from your students or from how you taught or switching it up, change something around to create that dynamism so you don't get static into everything that there is to know is known. Um, and make sure that you're challenging yourself to add material, to uncover new things that you could change uh, when you're teaching. And creating that space for doubt, critique, deconstruction. Um, this is less common, I think, in, in some medical education where you know the, the how to diagnose Barrett's esophagus, there's not a lot of deconstruction there. I mean, uh, some of it is, is obviously not applicable to some clinical settings. But to talk about um, which voices have been privileged to this point and what might this look like if this author uh, were looking at this theory or not. Um, I talk about or orthopedics and how there's been such a lack of women in biome biomechanical and biomedical engineering as well as orthopedics. And it wasn't until the mid-80s that we had an artificial hip specifically designed for women. When archaeologists can look at a skeleton from thousands of years ago and determine whether it's male or female based on the curvature of the pelvis and the differences in, in um, bone structure, yet we never thought of creating hip replacements that actually worked. And we're 50% of the population, right? So. Last time I checked, we weren't exactly a minority, but yet, again, who is, who is creating these things, right? You can talk about Band-Aids when Band-Aids first came out, right? Now there are all sorts of different colors and all sorts of things, but they were meant to sort of be flesh-colored. Um, and I don't think anyone at 3M who was at the table had any pigment in their skin, or I would have raised my hand and said, whose flesh is this supposed to be matching? You know, if we look at the population of the United States, maybe we need to be changing this. Um, and I think there are lots of examples like that in medicine where as devices are made and things are done, we can step back and point out the need for more voices at the table that help us create a better product that meets um, the needs of more patients. Uh, and finally, acknowledgement. So silence is a form of communication. The absence of words is also a message. So w when I'm working with residency programs on diversifying, you have to say something about diversity on your website, in your materials, as those third years are trolling around the internet. When I talk to my residents about how they learned about programs, they use the word scour. We scour the web, any pictures we can find. And they said, if your pictures are old, that's a red flag. If you don't have this, that's a red flag. I mean, I got my education um, from these residents who were telling me how they went about choosing which programs uh, to apply. So not having a message either means you don't know or you don't care. And when I'm on the receiving end, that feels the same. So if we care about something, or we want to make sure, like we put these accommodation statements in our syllabi, right? Saying, if you need accommodations, we need you to know. 
we could put diversity statements in our, in our syllabi saying this class aims to address the full spectrum of identities in the room and if we're not doing that, I would like to hear about it. We're setting those expectations for students to be able to acknowledge um, what, we, what we're expecting. And you don't have to be an expert, like I said before, as long as you know how to ask a good question, as long as you can facilitate a discussion and create that space, um, we don't have to have all the answers. And using the caution with the assumptions that we're making. Um, and this is a really common one that I hear complaints from students about, and it's all well-meaning. I have a, a student who's um, Diné, Navajo, and she grew up uh, in a suburb in Arizona and, and uh, visited the res several times, but didn't grow up on a reservation, and was asked in her medical school class when they were discussing um, different types of forms of healthcare, oh, well, Marla, why don't you tell us about IHS? You're Navajo, you must know all about IHS. Um, and she, no, I, I actually don't know anything, anything more than anybody sitting next to me about Indian Health Services. So be careful about saying that I'm assigning an expertise to someone based on their identity, right? Because we mix these things up all the time, right? Not all people of color have any expertise on critical race theory or political science or any of the other things that might impact these larger discussions that we're having. Um, no more than I can walk up to a man and say, well, you're a man, you must know how to fix a car. Put this, put this catalytic converter in or tell me how to do, I mean, these are silly assumptions, but when the populations are less visible, we make them much more easily. Or we say, oh, these students can talk about the effects of poverty, and, and they're like, no, nah, I, I grew up in the suburbs. I, I've never been on public assistance before. Um, so I think sometimes in our attempt to draw in that, we make assumptions about identity and expertise that are not necessarily true, and these are the things that students kind of look at us like, what are you doing here? So again, doing a, a little bit of a pre-class assessment so you know what types, of, what types of unique experiences have the students had that you think you could ask about that might be relevant to, to some discussions. So if you do that and you get challenged, you can say, oh, I actually have had a conversation with this student or in the pre-class assessment I was aware that this student um, had this. Because sometimes it's not the student who is the focus of it, it's other students that will, that will come up and say, hey, the professor did this to this student and we thought, we thought that it was inappropriate. Um, inviting learners to add their dimensions to the classroom um, in either in assignments. I, I try to leave it open and say you know, making students responsible for their learning is the best way to keep them engaged. And so if there's something that they want to do, they have an idea, they want to do this project instead of that project, um, design me your own assignment and, and let me know. And I will be flexible in, in making sure that, that that works. If my class is on healthcare delivery and I'm really missing this whole group of maybe I didn't do anything about undocumented students and, and healthcare for undocumented populations and, and a student says I want to do my project on this and you didn't list it as an option. Absolutely. Like I'm not going to be able to know the full spectrum of, of things that students are curious about that are relevant pieces of learning for my students um, if I don't invite them to add dimensions to their assignments based on what they want to know and what they think their peers might want to know as well. Um, and discussing bias, even if briefly, that can lessen the emphasis on identity domain and reduce stereotype threat for learners. So just even acknowledging and saying, um, we want to make sure that, that we are clear about there's a bias to this study, there's a bias to that study. If a pharmaceutical company publishes results and says we should use this, obviously we try to acknowledge where that came from. And we should do that in the other forms of uh, our knowledge as well. So. Um, we learn best when we feel that we belong and we, we, when a learning environment is created where we feel welcome to bring our entire self into the room um, and when we're both challenged and accountable, you know, dually with students, that the teaching should represent um, some excitement for us, we're going to learn something new, we're accountable to, for the students for this shared experience that we have and hopefully can create some learning settings that really bring out the best in us as well as the best uh, in our learners. So I'll end with that and um, we can have some time for questions. Yes. So I, have a, I would uh, be interested in your advice about uh, being in a classroom where um, students that I think may be less confident about belonging are clustered with themselves, with someone of like color or like experience. And I don't then feel very confident about busting that up. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, how do I, in the classroom, how do I manage the phenomenon of why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Right? So there's a book by Beverly Daniel Tatum that's called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And I think a great gauge of that would also be to do this group mixing thing 
where some you say you're coming in today, find your assigned table, and you force people to sit differently so they can break out of that. Sometimes you let people choose, and sometimes you assign. Um, and if you give them a task, and you kind of sometimes have to push the envelope. Um, but that, I think, says that in general, the learning environment as assumed by the students and their previous experiences in the classroom says that they're most protected and feel some level of comfort sitting together. That the integration in the classroom is not safe, their ideas might not feel welcome, they're gonna have less of a learning experience than if they stick together. Um, so then a good feedback mechanism for, for you is to say, if I mix the groups intentionally, I try to have some active learning, then I let people choose, does that happen again? Or did, did I make any, any progress here? You know, and it, it's a fine line because you don't, you don't want to make people, learners feel really uncomfortable, um, but maybe mixing it up even within one classroom um, activity of saying, for this activity, you're going to be assigned to a group of, of such and such. Um, of repetitive um, engagement mm -hmm. um, with those groups. So it's uh, you know, kind of just leave it alone, you know, as one response mm -hmm. and let people be where they're most comfortable. Yeah, and it depends on what it is. I mean, if it's just students that are going through and they're doing physical diagnosis or something and they're going to gravitate towards who they're most comfortable with and um, it's not necessarily as relevant, then we could. But if there's a piece of the learning that's taking place, especially if, you, if it's going to be a longitudinal experience, I think intentionally mixing students. Um, but that requires a lot of management. And again, thinking about when I do the pre-class profiles, um, that really helps me think about uh, which students might actually hit it off based on the things that they tell me about their background. Um, and that, I think, does help students feel more comfortable getting to know people who are different from them. You know? But we all want to be with our friends. When we go to conferences, what do we do? We go find all of our friends. We hang out with our friends. We don't need new people. <laughs> I have a question. I, do, um, I direct a course for the, the preclinical year, so it's the full 110 plus medical students. And, um, there was an instance last year where um, a lecturer kind of uh, really sort of was inappropriately belittling of a question that was asked in the large group session, which I think is always a little uncomfortable for certain members of the class to begin with. And um, I just would be curious about your thoughts about how to deal with it. So as the person sitting in the room, uh, almost every student in the room, and myself included, felt very uncomfortable with the way it went down. But I, I have to say I was a little left at a loss of how to deal specifically with the lecturer who I'm not sure had the insight of, of what was done. And, um, and then also the best strategies to sort of deal with the student who, who was affected. Yeah, so when a student might ask a question, a lecturer in front of everyone is, is belittling of the student and how do you deal with this really uncomfortable situation where clearly there's something that, that's happened that's inappropriate. Um, one of my favorite phrases that I use just as an ally, because I think part of the difficulty is we don't expect these things to happen, right? If we did, we, we wouldn't be like, yay, I'm going to go and deal with all the offensive things in the world today. Like we just have a latent assumption that people do their best and that this isn't going to happen. Um, so I like the phrase, of, what did you mean by that? Just to be able to say, if somebody said, well, well that's a dumb question. Well, excuse me, what did you mean by, do you, do you mean that the students shouldn't be asking questions, or would you like a clarification about the question? You know, part of it is you might not be able to address it in the moment, um, but might follow up with a faculty member and say, you know, maybe asking for the question to be restated. We want it to be open. We want students to feel comfortable asking questions in, in lecture. And then talking to the student and just, you can um, reaffirm to them their place and their sense of belonging as a learner and that asking questions and their curiosity is a strength without throwing your colleague under the bus, right? Without saying, oh, this person's a bad actor, but just to say, hey, you know, sometimes faculty aren't at their best and I want you to know that I recognize that and I, I saw that as something, I disagreed with that behavior and um, hopefully it'll be better, but don't stop asking questions and that's a strength kind of thing. Um, but it is difficult. I think coaching, the difference between coaching and mentoring as with coaching, we expect to be told what we're doing wrong. 
and in mentoring, sometimes we want like a cheerleader only. And so um, implementing some kind of uh, peer faculty review, and it's difficult. I only know a couple schools that do this, but they have faculty sit in on each other's classes, or they have one dean that sits in on lecture and provides feedback and says, your stuff wasn't interactive enough. Here's what you can be doing better. Um, and not necessarily with just what comes back with the course reviews. Because we think, oh, the course reviews, all's well that ends well. And the students just kind of buzz through them because we say, you have to do this before you know, this date, or, or, or you're in trouble. Um, being able to give that active feedback, and if it's expected that we're all going to do that for each other, then there's already a platform to say, when students ask a question, obviously the, the person might be frustrated because they might have touched on that point 10 times, and then they're asking a question. Um, and it's hard to step back an ed educator and say, um, there must have been something that I wasn't conveying effectively if I got a question about something that I hammered on repeatedly. So what was it? Can somebody else help me figure out what I was missing? Um, but yeah, I definitely like what did you mean like that, by that. I like, um, I disagree, you know, I disagree with that approach and, and definitely making sure that you follow up with a student. Um, it goes a long way when an ally kind of steps forward and, and lets them know. And depending on how severe it was, I think sometimes it's important to address that with the whole class. Um, you might have to just say, let's go back to next week. There's something I want to address. You know, as course director, these are my values. These are the things that are important to me. Um, recognize that we're not perfect, we all make mistakes, but you know, I, I want to let you guys know that I'm aware of it and this is what I hope is better in the future. Yeah. So I'm curious about how we know if we're doing a good job. So if you could tell a little bit about maybe methods that we could assess in our environment. I know people do a lot of climate surveys, but is that something you would recommend? Are there data things we can be doing? How do we know that we're doing a good job? Hmm. Um, assessment, I think, is always a challenge. Like, how do we know what we're doing in terms of the actual learning? We have our, all of our concrete stuff around board scores and clerkship scores and things like that. I think a, a climate survey or a, an educational survey, we have our GQ at the end that kind of talks about how students feel that they've been treated. Um, I think making sure that students know that if there's things that happen in the classroom that fall below this, what we expect in terms of respect with our profession that we hear about it is good. I go with the 10% rule that I'm only hearing about 10% of what's actually happening. So how many reports am I getting from students about breach or breaches of the learning environment uh, code and what we are expecting. Um, a climate survey, there's a ton of them out there. If you pick one, just pick that one and stick with it because always trying to find a better one kind of messes up your baseline. So even just asking students um, about the classroom, how it is that they feel uh, on campus. And um, sometimes it's a little screwed because the, there's an adjustment effect. So some of the surveys that, that University of Michigan did around belongingness, inclusion, and diversity found that when they actually uh, opened up all these discussions around diversity and then asked people about it, the scores actually went down because people were more aware of some of the problems and then were more engaged than they were before and then showed that, oh, we really thought we were here, but we weren't. And there's also an adjustment, like an expectations adjustment, where underrepresented students expect it to be bad. And when it's just bad some of the time, they score it OK. right? So it's the difference between asking, like, do you eat healthy? Oh, of course I do. Have you ever eaten a donut? Right? That's not the same question. So I think a lot of our surveys are, oh, are you a healthy eater? Yeah, I'm a healthy eater. But has any of these things ever happened? And so the specificity, uh, how we ask those things. Um, you can do it in your own course assessment, even if you want to do SurveyMonkey and make it anonymous if there's enough learners in your class, just to make it clear, like, I really want to know if I'm, doing, if I'm doing a good job at this. And please let me know if the classroom was conducted with respect, if there were instances where it weren't. You know, I want to know. And then you know, when you're mixing groups, you can kind of see how much um, people are getting out of their comfort zone and how, how brave and vulnerable are they willing to be in learning settings. And that gives you a good kind of day-to-day -day gauge, too. Yeah. Here, maybe, yeah. yeah I, so kind of a follow-up to that, um, and I, I hope this doesn't come off as being criticism, but um, thank you. Lots of really great pearls there for our, our own personal development. but. I think, I'm wondering, you talked about a climate survey for students, but what about uh, an assessment of the entire college and university? We have 30 or 40 faculty here, but um, I heard terms in your talk, you know, microaggression, white privilege. Have we ever assessed whether we all know what those are? Um, and there are some tools. I, I work on a federal grant. Maternal Child Health Bureau has um, a cultural linguistic competency 
assessment that can be done periodically um, at schools and organizations. We do it in our grant every five years. Um, we ask the students to do projects in places, I guess, or something as a self-assessment, but I've never been asked as a faculty to do it. So I would sort of challenge the academy to get on board. With, this is a great talk, but I think we need to do certainly more as an organization. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And I think, do, you know, again, we teach who we are. So if there are members of our faculty who feel really marginalized, that will come through and trickle down to our students and how we're teaching things. And so the campus overall, I think, does absolutely inform uh, how well we're doing. So Dr. Tando will get right on that and uh, <laughs> do a big... Uh, no, we, are doing, we are doing a kind of survey. We actually up this year for uh, of students. No, no, the entire the entire, entire. Yeah, the entire. Yeah, the entire. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Are we about out of time?